Okay, I'm thinking of the of another verse that's coming up here, but uh, we we'll get to that in a minute here. Um, but the Bible talks about being putting the Lord to an open shame, and I believe that that's because somebody has received the mark. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But the fact of the matter is, I believe that this is for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. I think that that's what's going on there. You know, and again, you say, well, Brian, I think that this is for us today. Okay, have you sinned willfully? You say, yes, but I believe I can be saved. It's not what it says here. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. See? So you can't use this as a proof text for somebody losing their salvation and then getting it back. Because it teaches that you can't get it back. But now I'll show you the two other ones here uh, in the same chapter, or in the same book, excuse me. You have uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I think this is probably the one I was thinking about. Um, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. That's the one I was thinking of. I was got my mind a little bit mixed up there. It's in chapter 6 there. What's going on? Well, here you have this tribulation saint and they're at one time they're going around and they're preaching Jesus Christ and I you know will not be part of this system and everything else and then they get weak and they stumble and they fall they go take the mark of the beast they worship the beast and all of a sudden people are going hey look, look at that guy look at look at him going over there he used to be one of these ones I won't take the mark look at that he's got it cuz I do believe that the bible teaches the mark of the beast is a twofold thing implantable microchip in the hand in the forehead but revelation 20 says that it's upon the forehead see there will be scanners and gps and rfid and all that other stuff that goes on scanning people that have that implantable microchip but there's also going to be a visible mark see that you can just be walking down through the city and you can just be looking at anybody and oh he's got the mark she's got the mark they got the mark the mark 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 you can see it right on their forehead See, it's going to be a twofold system. Now imagine somebody that was saved and people knew that they were saved. They knew that they were standing against this system. And all of a sudden you look and you see, there's that guy. Look at that guy. He's got the mark. Hypocrite. What are they doing? They're putting Jesus Christ to an open shame. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 12 through 14 says here, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Do you have to hold the beginning of your confidence steadfast unto the end right now to be saved? No. Okay. That doesn't apply for us today as Christians living right now in this church age. But it's going to apply to the, a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Read Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Uh, for he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. See, there's this thing of having to make it through to the end to be saved. They don't have eternal security in that time period. All right, 1 John 1, 9. Here's the next one, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We read the email. I know that you talked a bit about this verse in your sermon. My question is verse 9, referring the act of repentance to becoming a saved Christian or repenting after you are saved for sins committed or something else. Well, let's read the context of what's going on here. 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. If we say that we have fellowship, notice that word, uh, fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Question. Can you get saved by confessing your sins to God? No. You cannot get saved by confessing your sins. You get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. All right? You can confess your sins all day long. You aren't going to get saved. You have to put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. See? So that verse there, verse 9, is not about salvation. Okay? It's not saying that you have to confess your sins and stay in a confessed state and die in a state of grace or in a state of belief or something like this. Uh-uh. That's not what's going on there. What's going on is what we saw there in verses 6 and 7. Fellowship. You want to stay in good fellowship with the Lord? What do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 at the beginning of the study? If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Okay? You stay in fellowship by judging yourself. All right? You want to have a good marriage? Stay confessed up. Don't try to hide things from your, from your husband or from your wife or whatever. Be honest. Have honesty. They're in the relationship. That's how you have a good relationship. Not by hiding things and covering things up. That leads to problems. And so it is with the Lord. You try to cover things up. And you know, you can hide things from your wife. You aren't going to hide anything from God. All right. What God sees when he sees a Christian that's, uh, I didn't do anything. I, I'm not doing anything wrong. Or is up there saying, yes, you are. I saw you do it. I was there in the room. I saw what you were doing. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. I mean, you're not going to get away with anything with God. So it's good to come to God and say, I'm sorry, I sinned, I, that was wrong. I mean, you know what I did, Lord, and I'm ashamed that you know that. I'm sorry. See, judging yourself. That's very important. All right. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Okay, it says here, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. All right, let me read the email here real quick. His email states, in Revelation 3, 3, they are called to repent of their sins. Then in Revelation 3, verses 4 through 5, it talks about those that have not defiled their garments. In Revelation 3, 5, it then says that they will not have their names uh, blotted out of the book of life which means those that did not repent will have their names blotted out. To have your name in the book of life to start with, doesn't it mean that you have to be saved? If you can't lose your salvation, why would it say that their names will be blotted out if they do not repent? Very good question. Extremely good question. And uh, that's too big of a question for this study, so join us next week at... Sorry, that's what you'll get in most Babel buildings, but uh, I'm going to answer your question. All right, now, there are different ways to interpret these seven churches. And if you've seen some of my other studies, you'll know what I'm talking about here. First of all, you have the most obvious one, and that is that they are seven geographical churches that existed in the first century that John's writing to, obviously. Okay, but then there's also some other ways to interpret this. The second way is, that these seven churches typify seven periods in church history. And that's, there's some good application there, but there's also some issues with that. Another thing is that you can typify seven different types of Christians by these seven churches. Okay? Because, see, seven church periods, the Philadelphian church period, there were people within that church period that were more Laodicean than they are Philadelphian. Just like today, the Laodicean church period, we're not all lukewarm. 
Okay, You can't say that every Christian that's alive today in the Laodicean church period is a lukewarm Christian. There are Philadelphian type Christians. There are Christians too that are being martyred, like some of the other churches. So there are issues with these. But there's another thing that you can say about these seven churches. And this is an interesting thing. I've had, you know, somebody, has, different people have said this to me, and I really, I don't know. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is very detailed, and, and some of it, it's just, the Lord hasn't given me any light on this yet. And there is a theory that these seven churches could actually be churches in the time of Jacob's trouble. You see, you say, oh, Brian, the church age ends. The church age ends. Well, what does the word church mean? It means a called out assembly. So it's not some kind of a sacred holy thing that only appears right now and it won't in the time of Jacob's trouble. There will certainly be called out assemblies in that time. Definitely. So could there be some application here to people that are in the time of Jacob's trouble that mess around, take the mark, their name's taken out of the book of life? I don't know. But I'm going to show you an interesting tie-in here to this thing of a name being taken out of the book of life. First, we'll look at the significance of the book of life. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and uh, verse 15. What's the importance of being in the book of life? Well, here it is. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This happens after the millennial kingdom is over, the great white throne judgment. Okay. If you're not in the book of life, you're going to the lake of fire. So if, you're, if you are in the book of life and your name is taken out of the book of life, uh, that's a problem. Okay. Very interesting. Now let me show you a very... Very interesting verse that ties into this. Revelation chapter 22. Actually, two verses. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. It says here, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. I just want to illustrate my point here for a minute. I've heard different people try to exposit this, and I've never really heard a satisfactory uh, response about this, or a satisfactory uh, explanation. Okay? I have here a $10 bill. Okay? Now, if I told you, see it's right there, and I say, there, I took it out of the book of life. Um, no, you took it off of the book of life. Where would this thing have to be for me to take it out of? It would have to be in, wouldn't it? For it to come out, it has to first be in. You catch what I'm saying? You call me up on the phone, you say, hey, Brian, what are you doing? Well, I just took some biscuits out of the oven. You say, oh, then they were never in the oven to begin with? No. For them to come out of the oven, they had to have been first in the oven. See, so if you want a second possible justification for somebody losing their salvation. And I do believe that this isn't just in the time of Jacob's trouble. This could be for today too. I think if you mess with this book, you know, I know this one wasn't on the list that, that uh, he sent me, uh, the thing of Revelation 22 verses 18 and 19. But if you want justification for somebody losing their salvation, I would say when you have somebody that's starting to pervert God's word on purpose, not just misquoting a verse, but somebody perverting God's word and changing it on purpose and then coming out and saying, this is God's holy word. And it's their own words. You have somebody there that I think if they were saved, if they were ever saved, I believe that there's a very real possibility that they're going to be losing their salvation. That their name is taken out of the book of life. Their part is removed there. See? 
And I know that's controversial. Oh no, he's, he's bringing up questions about eternal security and possible exceptions to the rule. Yeah, I know that. But you see, when you're starting to get into that realm of hating the Jewish people and changing, purposefully changing and perverting the Word of God, you're not dealing with the flesh anymore. You're now dealing with spiritual matters. We're not dealing with the sins of the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. You're now dealing in the spirit realm. And at that point in time, God only knows, okay, God is the one who can judge whether somebody has crossed that line or not. Because I'll grant you, there are false prophets out there. Christians can fall for the teachings of a false prophet. And they can say some really stupid things. I did in the past, okay? I've said some dumb things, you know, before I got into ministry. And, it, of course, I say dumb things in ministry, too, sometimes. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I think that when you start to cross these spiritual lines and you get to a point where you're so prideful that you will not go back and you will not admit to being wrong and you start to change the Word of God to fit your warped philosophies, you're headed into some very, very dangerous territory. And again, I'll mention him again, Stephen Anderson. Stephen Anderson openly hates the Jewish people so there's strike number one. Number two, he changes the Word of God. I've heard him do it. And he'll do it in a very subtle way. He'll come out and he'll, he'll yell some scripture and, then he'll, you know, and he'll, he'll, he'll rip off some verse of scripture and you go, whoa, hold on a second here. And you look it up and you say, the Bible doesn't even say that. And it's interesting because the way he changes the Bible when he's quoting it, it makes it line up with his philosophy. And if you actually look up the verse and read it the way it says, it disproves what he's saying. And now I saw he was supposed to be coming out defending the King James with these, this new series of King James moments or something like this. And now he's teaching Greek. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, he might as well teach Greek because he can't handle English. So, whatever. But if you want a good example of a guy that I believe could have been saved at one point in time and now is lost because he's attacked the Jews and he's changed the word of God, Steven Anderson is a perfect example of that. And he's got all kinds of other issues too. You can watch my videos on him. But we'll continue. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Remember it talked about there in Revelation chapter 3 about holding fast, you know, and things. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Um, you're supposed to hold fast to this book. Don't start to change it because you can't handle it. All right. When you find the sound words of the King James Bible, you hold fast to it. Somebody comes out and says a better rendering would be, they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, keep this in mind when you have people attacking the King James Bible. You have 54 of the greatest scholars that have ever lived, tutors to the queen, men that were reading Hebrew when they were four years old, you know, and you have these guys, 54 of them, spend seven years translating the King James Bible. Each book, every word in the King James Bible has to pass, I think it was like seven different tests. You know? All this test, all this time and everything else. And now you got one quote-unquote scholar or some user on YouTube and they're telling you that the King, they know better than the King James translators? Sure. Sure they do. I mean, don't even give them the time of day. But um, you're supposed to hold fast the form of sound words. And when you get so prideful and so arrogant that you begin to change the Word of God, knowingly change the Word of God, and pervert Scripture, and then say this is superior to what the book says, you are in serious trouble of losing your salvation. Don't mess with that. 
Psalm 138 verse 2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Many Christians wouldn't think of using God's name in vain, but they won't, don't think twice about blaspheming this book. You better be careful when you make fun of the King James Bible. Revelation 3, verse 16. Here's the final one that uh, this brother had sent me about, questions about. Revelation 3, 16. I'll get to it here. Okay, it says here, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Read the email. Okay, he says here, I am unsure what, uh, I am unsure was to what this is referring to, or as to what this is referring to. Is this verse talking about our salvation, or is it referring to our heavenly inheritance? Well, what this is talking about is true versus false conversion. Okay? And I've said about this in other studies, but I'll just cover it one more time. What's going on there is you have somebody who is uh, basically, you know, the body of Christ. You have the body of Christ. Um, if, if you spew something, what is it that comes out? Is it your heart or your lungs or your foot or your arm? No, it's the food, the foreign matter that's in the stomach. Okay, And there are many people that have the appearance like they're in the body of Christ, but in reality they're like foreign matter in his body. They're not truly saved. And at the rapture, what you're going to have is you're going to have these false converts. They're going to be seen, it's going to be finally seen, who was really saved and who wasn't. They're going to come out. It's going to be like spewed out. God's like, you, make, you people make me sick. That's what God thinks of the average modern Christian that doesn't care anything about truth and whatever else. They make him sick. So at the rapture, even though they're a professing Christian, sorry, out you go. That's what's going on there. Okay, Doesn't have anything to do with eternal security because they're not eternally secure to begin with. Okay, They're not redeemed. Kind of like the people back there in Matthew chapter 7, I think it is, where the Lord says, you know, I never knew you. He doesn't say, well, I once knew you, and now I know you no more. He says, I never knew you. Okay, We're going to see about that later on, too. Now we're going to look at a couple more that I got off a website online that was attacking once saved, always saved. And they said, here are some scriptures that prove that eternal security is a lie. So we're going to look at these quick, and then we'll be done with the study. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Okay, it says here, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. All right. And the argument here is they say, well, see, it says the, they deny the Lord that bought them. So the argument is that Jesus bought them, but then later they deny him and they go to hell as a result. Okay. Now, that doesn't work. All right. I'm going to show you why in just a little bit here. But it says there, the Lord that bought them. Um, do you believe in limited atonement or that the blood of Jesus Christ is available for anybody? Okay, the price has been paid at Calvary. Anybody can come to the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you can have anybody can get saved. So that purchase price is there. But the people look and they say, the Lord bought me. The, the price is there. It's been paid you see, but I deny Jesus Christ. And what's in context there? False prophets and false teachers. These are not truly saved people. Okay, these are people that have never been saved. All right, very important to get that. Jump down to verse 17 there in that chapter, Second Peter 
chapter 2, verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, up here, but they never really got saved, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Witnessing to somebody who thinks that they're saved is a lot harder than witnessing to somebody who knows that they're not saved. Verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Um, are dogs and sows, are they saved? No. If you're saved, you are likened to a sheep. Okay? And if you're a sheep, you don't turn into a dog when you sin or into a sow if you're a woman when you sin okay these are talking this whole passage is talking about people who have a head knowledge people that know the right things to say you know so many people i mean you know, i've said this in so many studies you know something like 75 percent of america is professing christian 75 americans 75 percent of americans are not saved i mean that's ridiculous See, what do they have? Most people have a head knowledge up here, but they were never truly born again. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, scriptures unto their own destruction. Now see, I do believe that that would be people that mess with the scriptures and God destroys them as a result. Verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Okay? Be careful when you start hearing people correcting the King James Bible. Don't fall into that same error. That's a very, very, very dangerous place to go to. All right? Galatians chapter 5. I'll show you another one that people will try to use to prove, disprove eternal security for a Christian today. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. It says here, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Okay? And they say, see, they fell from grace, they were saved, then they went back to the law, and therefore they fell from grace. That means they were lost. No, it doesn't mean that. It just simply means now, if you want to be judged by the law, God's not going to have much grace for you. Okay? Let me show you something here. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? You see, there's a movement out there where people get saved, and they see the struggle between flesh and spirit, and instead of just going, well, it's just going to be there, I'm just going to fight this thing, and the best way for me to fight it is go out and serve Jesus Christ. Go pass out tracts and go witness to people and read the Bible and pray and sing the right kind of music. Instead of doing that, what they do is they take the Bible and the Bible becomes just kind of ceremonial to them. And you just kind of read it and, you know, read it eight hours a day, you know. And, uh, you know, you do all these things and you try to clean up the flesh and sanctify the flesh. You can't do that. 
okay? It's like some body dies and you got this dead corpse there and you say, you know what? I think I'm going to keep this corpse looking beautiful. <laughs> you can't do it. A corpse is not beautiful and cannot be made beautiful. And the longer it's around, that's going to become more apparent. All right? Hey, the longer you deal with your flesh, it's going to become more apparent to you. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's what you understand. So what these people do is they try to go back and they try to say, I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments and I'm going to live above reproach. And they do all these things to try and purify the flesh and redeem the flesh. You can't redeem the flesh. That's God's job. And that happens at the rapture and not before. So when you fall from grace, in the sense of you going back under law, all you're doing is God's just going to say, oh, okay, you're justified by the law now, okay, whatever. And He's not going to have much grace for you. All right. If God sees that you're doing His work and that you're really trying and you're confessing your sins to stay in fellowship and judging yourself and things, God will have grace for you. But if you're trying to go out and justify yourself and say, I'm holy, I'm righteous, I'm wonderful, I'm good, God's not going to have much grace for you when you do that. Why? You're relying on your own righteousness. You might be saved, but you go back and you become self-righteous. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You ought to know this by heart, but we'll turn there anyhow. I realize I have some believers or some viewers that are newer believers. You might not know this yet. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what happens too with these people that try to go back under the law, try to sanctify the flesh. They begin to believe that they're justified by their works, so they start to boast. That's not what the Lord wants for you. Okay, James chapter 5. And again, people try to use things. They don't understand the Bible dispensationally. They don't rightly divide the word of truth. So you have these people, they'll go to books that are pointed for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. And they say, see, this disproves eternal security. And they'll point to verses like we read about there in Hebrews. Those verses do disprove eternal security, but it's for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble that takes the mark of the beast. See? So they start to cross dispensational lines to prove their doctrine for today. It doesn't work. I'll show you a good example here. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So, they say, brethren there, the brethren, that saved people, they're erring from the truth, and then one converts him. See, so they lost their salvation, and then they came back. That's what they're trying to say. No, read it according to the context. Go to James chapter 1. What's the context of the book of James? James chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says here, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Christians which meet in church buildings. Oh, wait, I read that wrong. It says, To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. When did the twelve tribes show up again? Revelation chapter 7, in the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations. Are there going to be temptations? Mm -hmm. In the time of Jacob's trouble, there are going to be massive temptations. You know what the big one's going to be? To take the mark of the beast. I mean, hey, you need something to eat right now? What do you do? You say, well, I go to the refrigerator. Okay, you don't have any food in the refrigerator. What do you do? You go to the store. How about you go to the store and they say, no mark, no food. You talk about a temptation. When your stomach, when you haven't eaten in about a week, you're going to be mighty tempted. Not you, meaning Christians, but somebody in that time, they will be mighty tempted tempted to take that mark and what you're going to have is you're going to have some Jew and he's going to be like I can't take this anymore I I got to go to the store and they, whoa, 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 whoa wait a second what do, you, what do you mean you're going to the store 
You're not going to take the mark, are you? I don't care what I have to do. I'm sick and tired of starving. I got to get something to eat. I'm going. And see, James chapter 5 there. If any of you do err from the truth, like a Jew that would be saying, I want to go take the mark of the beast, and one convert him, says, Jesus is coming. Whatever hunger you're feeling right now is not worth you going to hell. Remember, we're going to inherit the millennial kingdom. Remember the promises. We don't have that much longer to go. See, he converts him. He errs. He's starting to think, I'm going to go take the mark. He converts him, gets him back. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And what a death it would be to take the mark of the beast. And shall hide a multitude of sins. Yeah. Again, this is for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. All right? This is not for a Christian today. So you can't use those verses to try and disprove eternal security. For right now, it doesn't work. A couple more here. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. First Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine. Okay, first Corinthians chapter eight, verse nine through thirteen says, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Did it say anything in there about the guy losing his salvation? No. The weak brother perished in the sense of he messed around with sin and he died an early death. Why? Because he went into it saying, I guess it's all right because after all, brother so-and-so does it, you know. I mean, he's an elder. I mean, he's, he's really something, you know. Maybe like Paul, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to go, you know, hey, brother so-and-so, I know that you're a recovering alcoholic now. You just got saved and you were drunkard before then. But uh, hey, why don't we go down here? I'll buy you a drink. No. Would it be okay for Paul to have a drink? of wine or something like that. He's not going to lose his salvation over it. But see, he needs to keep in mind, if I drink this wine, this weak brother right here is going to justify the sin of drinking and he's going to go right back to it and he's going to end up dead. All right? He's not going to judge those sins because he's basing what I'm doing, you know, his truth on what I'm doing. See? That's why you put away sinning Christians that are in your fellowship. You put them away. You say, I'm not going to fellowship with you till you get that sin cleaned up. Why? Because if you don't, if you don't judge other Christians in their sins and let them come in and they're messing around and things and fornicating and looking at pornography and drunkenness and whatever else, you do that, other Christians are going to start to follow their example. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You see how that thing works? So again, all this is showing here is that a Christian starts to fall away and they mess around and God delivers them to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Again, this is not an argument for, or against, I should say, against eternal security. It doesn't work. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23. Okay, it says here, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister." So the argument is there that there's a condition. If you continue in the faith, then you'll be saved. It didn't say that. All right. It says there, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. 
you know, when you show up at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to want to be uh, holy, unblameable, unreprovable. That's all that's going on there. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Read Romans chapter 8, the whole thing. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the uh, flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay? That's all that's going on here. This is not somebody losing their salvation because they didn't continue in the faith. See? And again, what is this teaching that you don't have eternal security? What is it? It's works. See, if this passage here is teaching that you can lose your salvation, then how do you keep it? By the righteousness of Jesus Christ or by your own righteousness? See, that's the real issue there with eternal security. It's you working to stay saved. You know, the Catholic thing is you say, are you saved? They say, I am being saved. Got to watch out for this stuff. And I'll tell you what, there are some people that just ignorantly believe this thing that you can lose your salvation. You know, there are some heroes of the faith like John Wesley, you know. I mean, he had his issues, but, uh, you know, he believed that you could lose your salvation. And I'd say he was, you know, not a real strong student of the Bible, but in some ways there. But you have somebody that really, truly, they've always believed that they have to keep their salvation. You better check and make sure that you're even saved. Because you got to get to, you have to come to the end of your own righteousness, and put your faith 100% in Jesus Christ. And if you're continually working to stay saved and to get saved and make sure that you are keeping in salvation, whatever, you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ. You're in a dangerous spot. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two, verse eleven through thirteen, another great passage to prove eternal security. It is a faithful saying: For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. You say, "Oh, then you lose your salvation." No, keep reading. Verse thirteen: If we believe not yet, he abideth faithful; he cannot deny himself. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 sometime. It talks about the body of Christ. We are members of His body. When you get saved, you are now in Christ. That's why you are a Christian. All right? If you get to a point where you don't believe in Jesus anymore and you're living like a totally lost person, He will deny you millennial inheritance. He will deny you rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But He cannot deny Himself. And you are part of his body. See? That's what's going on here. We are talking about sinning Christians. Sinning according to the flesh. You aren't going to lose your salvation. And you don't have to die in a state of belief and continue believing to stay saved. That is heresy. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. A couple more verses here and then we'll be done. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Here's another one that I found on this website. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. They say, oh, castaway. See, that proves that you can lose your salvation. No, it does not. What it proves is, like the guy in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, whom I have delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. When you get to messing around with sin, if you don't get it confessed, you will be cast away in the sense of your health is going to be destroyed. Okay? You are weak. You are sick. And if you still don't get it taken care of, you sleep. You die. That's what's going on there. And notice in context, it's talking about running to receive a prize. See? What he's worried about losing is 
He's worried about losing rewards. Paul's not saying, I'm worried about losing my salvation here. If I don't do a good enough job, I'm going to lose my salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm in this race. I'm in it for good. Why? So I can obtain a prize. Not so I can stay saved. But guess what happens? You want to go out and you want to serve the Lord and you say, I got a big day of tracting today. I think uh, I'm going to start out my day with uh, a bottle of Dr. Pepper and three or four donuts. How effective a minister do you think you're going to be that day? Not too good. You say, uh, I think I'm going to do some work for the Lord today. I'm going to start out my day with uh, some raw milk and some uh, free range eggs and some uh, good uh, meat of some kind, whatever, you know, that doesn't have high fructose corn syrup in it. <laughs> and you eat good. What's going on? You're eating right. You're, you're keeping under your body. You're taking care of your body so that you can go out and you can gain rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Not so that you can stay saved. See, that's important to understand that. So again, another argument against eternal security that falls flat when you actually examine the Scriptures. Now we're going to turn to one more place here, Ephesians chapter 1. One more book, I should say, because we're going to look at two different passages within this. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Okay, these are the two, one of the, the two of the biggest arguments for eternal security. Okay, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. See, there's your salvation. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. You are saved, you are sealed, you are a purchased possession. Three things there that prove that you are eternally secure. You cannot lose your salvation. All right? It's right there. That's what's going on. You are sealed under the day of redemption. Okay? And I'm getting ahead of myself. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse uh, 29 through 32. Now remember what we read earlier about railing and things like that and messing around with the flesh and, and being fleshly and carnal? Look at this, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You don't want to fall from grace like in the book of Galatians. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of, or unto the day of redemption. You're sealed. God promised. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. See, so what you're doing is you're trying to live like a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're trying to live after the Spirit and not after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. See how all this stuff ties together. What's going on here, the whole argument with eternal security is the argument of if you sin in the flesh, do you lose your salvation? The answer is no. Now when you enter into the spirit realm, when you start to mess around with spiritual things, uh, God's going to have to be the judge of that. All right? Um, like I said, there are many places in Scripture where you see somebody that starts to mess around with the Jewish people. Uh, you see somebody starts to mess around with the Bible itself, the written Word of God. It's a very dangerous thing to get into. Read a few more verses for you here. Proverbs 13, verse 13 says, Whoso despiseth the Word shall be destroyed. But he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Lost versus saved. You despise the word, God will destroy you. Okay? They that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Your part's taken out of the book of life. 
That's stuff that I just simply don't mess with. You say, well, Brian, I don't believe that they can lose their salvation. I don't believe that those passages are about losing your salvation. Whatever. Okay, you want to play with fire, you go right ahead. But I read the plain English and it says their part is taken out of the book of life. That's a very, very scary thing. I'm not going to mess with the book. If you want to, go right ahead. That's your problem. Genesis 12, verse 3 says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You want God's blessing on your family? Pray for the peace of Israel. Stand up for that nation. If you know of a Jew, witness to him. You know, I made a, uh, I've done a couple sermons now trying to preach to Jewish people, trying to warn them about what's coming. Why? I love the Jewish people. That's why. You know, I want to bless them because I want God to bless me. I'm not about to curse the Jewish people. You say, well, Brian, I don't think that the thing of them, of you, you know, being cut off, I don't think that that has to do with your salvation. Okay, then play around with fire. I'm not going to. I'm not going to take my chances and say, I'll just make fun of the Jews and stuff like that so that I might run the risk of being cut off and lose my salvation. No, thank you. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9 says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. When you're dealing with the Jews, you are dealing with a kindred, with a geographic area. There are very few references to spiritual Jews. We are born in with the spirit of adoption and all that. I understand that. But you don't see anywhere where Christians, Gentile Christians, are supposed to go around calling themselves Jews. All right? That's real dangerous. Really, really, really dangerous. And I think that when you start to get into that realm of Bible correction, and you start to go and you start to curse the nation of Israel, if you want to make a case for losing salvation, I think that those are two possibilities. Only God knows that line there. When somebody crosses over that line, when they will no longer be admonished and be rebuked and, and corrected, when they cross that line, I believe that they lose their salvation. Why? You're getting into Satan's realm there. You know, God created Satan to be the anointed cherub that covereth in Ezekiel chapter 28. But Satan crossed the line, didn't he? Here he is, this heavenly anointed cherub, this beautiful being, this beautiful creature, and... He crosses the line with God, and God says, you're out. You're done. And I think that there might be some Christians that get to that point. Where they cross that line with the Lord, they start messing with the book. That's why Dr. Frank Logsdon, the guy, one of the co-founders of the New American Standard Version, when he was shown the truth about the New American Standard Version and how wicked it was, he got scared. And I have that recording here on YouTube. You can listen to that recording. And he said, it's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It's frightfully wrong. And you can hear the fear in the guy's voice. He's like, I'm, in, I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. He got scared. He got to that point where he realized he was doing it ignorantly. And he got to the point where he realized, whoa, I'm part of somebody, this, this movement here that's changing the word of God. And he backed away. And, whoa, I don't want anything to do with it. But you'll see some of these other modern version Bible correctors and they'll be like, and then they mock the King James Bible. They don't think anything of mocking the King James Bible. Do I believe that those men are saved? Well, they have really nice testimonies, but I don't believe they're saved. I believe their part is taken out of the book of life. And I believe that they're going to go to the lake of fire for all of eternity. Okay? So, hopefully that answers your questions. Um... I have a few more videos coming out here with viewers' questions, uh, some very interesting points that have been made, some very interesting questions that have come out. And uh, I like things like that. I like to have those challenges from Scripture. Um, uh, it's, it's good. I like to study the Bible. So uh, if you have any questions, any sermons that you don't have never heard anything on or any teachings, I'll try to do my best. You know, I'm certainly not perfect, but I do have a book that's perfect and a teacher that's perfect as well. Uh, he just has to get through the thick old skull here to, you know, teach me. So uh, that's going to be it for this study. Let's close with a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, that uh, you have provided such an easy way for us to be saved. Um, all we have to do is just drop our self-righteousness and our pride. We can come to you as sinners and repent and uh, get saved, Lord. Just call upon your name. That's all we got to do. And Lord, after that, we have an easy life after that because we have a book that tells us exactly how we're supposed to live. And uh, you have so much grace for us, Lord, and so much mercy for us when we sin that we come to you and we can confess those sins and you'll forgive us. And we get right back into fellowship with you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, if there's a Christian out there today and they are messing around with some kind of sin and they're not judging it, Lord, and they're, and they're sticking with it, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come into them and just uh, convict them of that sin that they're doing and that they're messing with and that they would get that thing confessed, Lord, and forsaken and get back in the right relationship with you. And uh, Lord, I thank you so much that we don't have to work to be saved, that you did all the work on the cross, Lord, for us. All we have to do is just stay in fellowship with you, Lord. And at the end of our lives, we it's not just that we've lived a good life, we also get to go home to be with you and get rewarded. It's a wonderful system, Lord. It sure is a blessing. And Lord, that blessing has come upon us because of the nation of Israel. And Lord, I do pray that uh, some Jews might get saved before this horrible time that's coming to that nation. It's such a horrible thing that's going to happen to them. And Lord, I understand why you're going to do it, but, but uh, it's to bring them back in line. And I just pray, Lord, that some Jews might get saved before this time comes. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would give each of us the strength and the courage to continue to stand for your word and that we would never fall for this horrible, wicked movement of Bible correction and the Alexandrian school of thought, naturalistic textual criticism and all these other satanic movements that bring out the new versions and attack the King James Bible. I pray that no one out there would be ashamed of your word, Lord, but they would stand for the King James Bible and not care what other people say. So, Lord, I just pray for strength for your people that are watching this video right now. And I ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it for this study. Uh, thank you for watching. Please keep us in your prayers, and we're going to be coming out with a lot more studies, Lord willing, here in the future as time permits. Uh, I apologize again for not having this thing done for Sunday morning, but we had technical difficulties. The whole video from before was ruined. So uh, uh, this one is the replacement video. So that's it. Thank you for watching.